inviting people to perform inside of his opening. Well, how could I refuse such a rare opportunity? So I decided to tell my romantic story. <laughs> it was 1967 the first full day of Hanukkah. I remember because my father, Irving Weinstein, had just given me a beautiful sterling silver bracelet the night before on Erev Hanukkah. I was working for my father at the Weinstein and Schlump funeral home on the Grand Concourse in the Bronx. I was responsible for making funeral arrangements and doing secretarial work. Well, that day, as I was going through the list of the next day's funerals, I just about shit my pants. <laughs> I read Ethel Levitt, daughter of Robert Levitt and Ethel Zimmerman. Ethel Zimmerman. Ethel Zimmerman. Jesus Christ, I was about to arrange the funeral for Ethel Merman's daughter. I couldn't feel my toes. I suddenly felt as if I had just inhaled a whole tank of nitrous oxide. I was having a near-death experience. I was about to meet Ethel Merman. I had already seen Gypsy three times and wore out my photograph needle listening to Everything's Coming Up Roses over and over again. Christ, how I wanted to lick her pussy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's how I masturbated about Ethel. With that huge mouth of hers surrounding my vagina. Imagine those same lips that sang, there's no business like show business functioning only to form a suction cup around my beaver. <laughs> It was just too much. <laughs> Ethel Merman was hot, and I wanted her badly. I knew she was a dyke, too, having married and divorced that horrible Ernest Borgnine in less than a year's time. It was gaydar long before Oprah coined the term. I scrambled to make the funeral as tasteful as possible. I went to the florist and handpicked the most beautiful flowers I could find. Then I made sure the chapel was spotless. I cleaned out all the toilets, and I filled up the tissue dispensers, too. Then the big question, what to wear? I went to my cousin Pincus's dress shop and borrowed the most gorgeous black taffeta dress I could find. Then I got my hair done, too. Needless to say, I couldn't sleep a wink that night. So excited to meet my role model, an object of female lust. <laughs> <laughs> 10 a.m. the next day. I was standing next to my father in the foyer of the funeral home, and a check of cab pulled up. I figured it was probably a relative of something, since surely Ethel herself would arrive in a limousine. A woman dressed in a long black coat, a black pillbox hat, and a muff on her hands walked slowly towards us. She was alone, her head bent down. We opened the door and she entered the foyer. She turned her face to me, not to my father. Her mascara was running down her face, but she saw me, looked into my eyes, and she actually smiled. Again, my body lost all sense of gravity as my skin became totally numb. It was her, it was Ethel Merman herself, looking into my eyes, crying. 
As if on autopilot, I said to her, my condolences, Mrs. Merman. Ethel opened her mouth, raised her right index finger as if to make a wisecrack, but she stopped herself before speaking, gave me a polite nod, a knowing smile, and proceeded to greet my father. Boy, these lunar bars are good. <laughs> They're for women, you know. It says so right on the package. Specially formulated for women. I call them my goddess bars. <laughs> A few other guests arrived. There were only a dozen or so guests in total, and Ethel seemed to ignore all of them. I was the only person she paid any attention to at all. She just, a knowing gleam is how I would describe it. And it turned me to mush every time. I just melted. And it wasn't for the reason I expected. I mean, I knew, I knew Ethel would make me feel nervous and jittery since she was a huge star and I was one of her biggest fans. But when I looked at Ethel and she looked at me straight from those beautiful hazel eyes, I felt something I'd never felt before. It was love. A future with Ethel Merman passed before my eyes. I pictured us growing old together. Of course, she was already old. <laughs> Ethel was at least 30 years my senior, not to mention the other logistical problems, including, but not limited to the facts, that Ethel was a huge star and that she and I were both women. All right. <laughs> there was no such thing as lesbian chic back then. Hardly anyone even knew lesbians even existed, and I had never even been with another woman at that point. I mean, I knew I liked them and wanted to eat another woman out, but I didn't think it would be entirely practical. Weekly bridge games were the closest I thought I would ever come to lesbian sex. So the guests started to leave, and Ethel sort of lingered behind. We were flirting, I think. What's your name, kid? Ethel asked. Madge, I told her. Madge, would you like to go for a cup of coffee with me? I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Ethel Merman wanted to go for a cup of coffee with me. Yes, my shaky voice replied. So we grabbed our coats and we went over to the 167th Street Delicatessen. We sat down in the booth. I ordered a bagel and cream cheese and a cup of coffee. She ordered hot tea. Yes, Mrs. Merman, the waiter gleefully obeyed. You're a lot like her, Ethel announced. Excuse me, I said. I was confused. You're a lot like my Ethel. Ethel Jr. She was a real looker, that kid. But she sure didn't get her looks from me. Ethel laughed. But what do you mean, Mrs. Merman? I told her. You're a beautiful woman. I know that kid. I was just kidding. Call me Ethel. Ethel stuck a hand out at me and smiled with a small tear in her left eye, which was strange to see. She was acting like everything was fine on one hand, but she looked profoundly sad in her eyes. A sudden look of seriousness fell upon Ethel's face as she continued to speak. <laughs> I want to give you this. It was a Hanukkah present for Ethel. I was going to give it to her last night, but I want you to have it, Madge, because you remind me of her. Ethel handed me a small gift-wrapped box. The wrapping paper was blue with little silver menorahs and dreidels all over it. Attached to the box was a card, and on it was her daughter's name, Ethel Jr. Ethel quickly <laughs> snatched the card and put it in her, her purse and clasped it shut. Then she pointed to the gift and said, open it. I did, carefully pulling the tape away from the paper so the paper shouldn't rip. <coughs> we both said, save the paper at the same time. <laughs> Everyone saved the wrapping paper back then, and nobody knew why. <laughs> Whose goddamn phone is ringing in my goddamn performance? What the fuck is that bullshit? Don't promise me there'd be none of that fucking bullshit here. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> it was a blue velveteen box. 
Oh, by the way, I would advise you to shut off your cell phone. At this point. Yeah, all right. It was a blue velveteen box. I opened it, and inside was the most beautiful pendant I'd ever seen. A rose like Gypsy Rose Lee, I guess. I was touched. <laughs> Do you have a chain? Ethel asked. Yes, I'm wearing one right now, I told her. Hand it to me, sweetie, Ethel, Ethel said. I unclasped the chain and handed it to Ethel. Ethel took the pendant and slipped it on to the chain. I felt Ethel's hands gently caressing my neck as she fastened the clasp of the chain. Her hands were cold, but so soft and gentle at the same time. As she touched me, a thousand butterflies took flight from my stomach. <laughs> she rested her hands on my shoulders for what felt like an eternity, but must have only been a few seconds in reality. And you know how they talk about hearing, butter hearing fireworks when it's love? Well, I heard Ethel Merman singing, Honey, everything's coming up roses and daffodils. Everything's coming up sunshine and Santa Claus. Everything's gonna be bright lights and lollipops. Everything's coming up roses for me. I couldn't fucking help it, I did. <laughs> and it fucking felt like I was in high tide at the beaches of Napoli, and a fucking tidal wave crashed on top of me. It crashed on top of me, and I fucking came. And glickus me a bacumen. My panties were soaked. And I'm sure she must have noticed the feminine scent caused by my... <laughs> While I was orgasming, Ethel was still standing above me. I'm not sure how much time passed. <laughs> They're a little dry. <laughs> it may have been a few seconds, or it may have been a few minutes. I don't know. But it was such ecstasy, such pure bliss, that I was in another place altogether. And it's funny, you know, here I am reliving this for you now, my gentle audience, and I'm realizing right now, as we speak, that Ethel Merman was the love of my life. Sure, there were others. They all left me eventually. I don't know why. Some said I was too caustic. Others said, <laughs> others said I'm just not ready for a relationship. But they all meant the same fucking thing. Madge, you're a caustic fucking bitch and I can't stand you for ten fucking seconds. I won't spend the rest of my entire goddamn life with you. Now get out of my face, you fat fucking cunt. <laughs> Christ, I need a cheese steak. <laughs> Ethel sat, gracefully picked up her cup of tea and took a sip. She slowly, yet very deliberately, looked up at me with those heavenly goddess eyes that could melt me like chicken schmaltz. <laughs> she smiled and said, I'd look beautiful on you. Huh? <laughs> I said, the necklace that looks beautiful on you, she said. Thank you, I answered in a voice so soft it was barely a whisper. The waiter came and put the check down on the table. Ethel picked it up and looked at it. Shall we? She said coldly and with a tone of finality. A wave of shocking disappointment came over my body. It's been a slice, kid. You've been great for me. So much like my poor little Ethel Jr. So sweet. Stay strong, kid. You'll need to. That was the last I ever saw of Ethel Merman. Sure, I've had other lovers, 
Martina, KD, Rosie. <laughs> Rosie. <laughs> but I still never had an orgasm like the one I had with Ethel that day. Ethel showed me love. It may have only lasted 10 minutes, but it was true love, and true love is timeless. Did you know that on the back of every Luna bar is a dedication from one woman of Luna to another? <laughs> well, I sent in a Luna bar dedication, and believe it or not, they printed it on my favorite Luna bar, Sesame Almond Crunch. <laughs> I'm going to read it for you now. It's Sesame Almond Crunch, goddammit! <laughs> I'm not, I'm, I'm not quite honey. That, I'm, no, oh, yeah, no. Uh, I, no. Uh, stop it, God damn it! Forget it. All right. When I said... Dear Ethel, you showed me love and you made me the woman I am today. You taught me that you have to be strong in order to bear this cruel world. You also taught me that you have to be weak in order to love. And that's something I'm still working on. Okay, we're gonna start track two. Love, Madge, a woman of Luna. Okay. <laughs> 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 I'm starting. Uh, they say that falling in love is wonderful. So they say. Uh, they say that falling in love is wonderful. It is wonderful. So they say. Thank <laughs> you.